Mateena! 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 Jenny, ano ba sa Italian yung ang ganda mo? Ah, say bellissima. Say bellissima, Jenny. Eh, ano naman sa Italian yung hindi ko alam ang gagawin ko pag wala ka? Ah, non so cosa fare senza di te. Jenny? Lino? Take my hand. Jenny, paano sasabihin kung papadala ako ng pera sa Pilipinas sa video ka ba yung savings account? Buongiorno, miss. Inbiyari din araw ora. Pilipinas. Posso vedere yung sa dokumento di identita, per favore? Quanti saudi vole mandare? A posto. Yes! I love you, Anna. Thank you. Ciao, bello. Ano raw? Wala. Okay na daw padala mo. Jenny, teka lang. Bakit? Nun sukosa farei senza dite. Jenny.
Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Business World one-on-one -on -one online interview series, which will give us insights from global experts and Philippine industry leaders that will help us navigate through the economic and business shocks of this pandemic. We are coming out with this series as part of Business World's 33rd anniversary multimedia report on the theme, The Road to Recovery. I am Willy Reyes, Editor-in-Chief of Business World. And joining us today from San Francisco is Emmanuel Maceda, Worldwide Managing Partner at Bain & Company, one of the top three global management consultancies with more than 50 offices in 37 countries. Manny, if I may add, is also Bain's first Asian global head who took over the reins of the company two years ago. Welcome to this series, Manny. It's my pleasure to be here, Willie. Thank you for inviting me and uh, happy to see everybody. Well, as someone who has spent decades helping firms boost performance, what is your take on what has changed for those leading organizations, especially as the pandemic struck? Well, it starts with your comment, Willie. Uh, um, most organizations are always trying to boost performance in some way. And, um, and that is a little bit of a continuous um, evergreen journey. I would say the, uh, this period, which um, perhaps not many expected, and uh, not that many organizations and management teams at the senior level really have had experience anything like this, uh, has uh, has created this uh, moment in time where every organization is thinking both defensively, starting with how do I survive this, but increasingly now as we've lived through it for a few months, uh, even longer than that in some parts of the world, uh, offensively, meaning how do I uh, use this time period that we're in to actually change my strategic position as a company, uh, transform, take some of the lessons with all the challenges we're facing, and, uh, and actually come out of this on the other side, and there will be another side, um, stronger as a company and stronger within your respective industries. So that's, um, that's a pretty um, common theme, regardless of where you are in the world, recognizing um, the current state uh, is quite different depending on what country or what industry and what your competitive position is. Now, is there any difference in challenges facing leaders of organizations in Asia Pacific and in the West, especially amid this crisis? I mean, you used to have Bain's Asia Pacific business. Uh, there are. Uh, it's hard to generalize, candidly, really Asia Pacific. Um, versus the West, uh, as you know, Asia Pacific encompasses everything from Australia to Japan to India and everything in between in general. And the West, uh, this thing is playing out quite differently in North versus South America and Europe, as well as country by country. So, um, so what I will say in general is that the, uh, the Asia Pacific countries as a group um, are farther along in the life cycle of the pandemic. Um, and so, in some cases, you're actually seeing uh, the other side, some, some return to, uh, uh, it's, not, it's not normalcy, but some semblance of uh, a new normal. If you're in a, in a Japan or in Australia or Korea to some degree, um, you, you are, have some degree of control. So I think that's, one difference and then even in what you call the west and how this has played out in europe which was the second center of the uh, pandemic after after asia and china um, there's a reasonable amount of getting to the other side of this versus here in uh, where i am in in the americas both north and south um, we're, we're still right in the middle of it so uh, there's many other factors but but uh, where each country is on the life cycle of this thing. And it's far from done, by the way, no matter where you are. But, but uh, 
Asia Pac went into this earlier. In general, it's going to come out also earlier. But how this is playing out in Asia is obviously quite different, as you might expect, uh, between an India or a Southeast Asia versus a Japan and Australia are, are quite different. Right. Uh, going to your turf, uh, can you tell us how Bain itself has changed amid this pandemic? I mean, what has changed in the way you do things? What has remained constant? You, you can think about us as, as, uh, as a consultancy, as a professional service firm. Um, a, we're global. So we are watching how this plays out um, all around the world. Uh, you know, B, we are primarily a, uh, it's a white collar workforce. It's a workforce that generally works in, in offices, in, in, in major cities, and, um, and then goes to uh, client locations. So if you think of that, and obviously there's many parts of companies that have that version whether you're in uh, uh, corporate, in, in sales, in uh, business relationship building. So um, for us, I think if, uh, what's different uh, as a global firm is, uh, is the most obvious one. We had to transition work that was primarily done in person, often in person, you know, with, uh, with obviously some enabling technology, perhaps interviews like this, we would have done uh, in person during a, a visit I would have made to the Philippines. Um, so the most obvious change is that 95% of the work the last few months has migrated to a remote model. And um, and one thing that's, uh, and we've done that, uh, number one, to keep our people safe because every, every corporate leader's uh, one of their primary missions right now, assuming the company is solvent and can stay healthy, as, as ours is, is to keep your workforce safe and, and healthy. And, uh, and so uh, we pivoted all around the world uh, to working from home. That means we will need to continue to do our work with our clients in this remote way, whether it's the, uh, you know, video conference of some kind, WebEx, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Google, whichever we choose, but with a set of um, analytics and capabilities and business uh, consulting uh, that you might have done in, uh, in an in-person uh, meeting. So uh, that, that has probably been the, uh, the biggest change operationally. And uh, I think to our surprise, and frankly, to the surprise of many corporations around the world, there's a lot you can do, yeah. even in this uh, even in this remote world, and um, and that uh, that's uh, that's been a, a pleasant surprise on the back of all of the obviously the bad news uh, we, we've all been dealing. With. Well, if I may ask, uh, has demand for your services uh, changed under this pandemic, especially as businesses revisit spending priorities? Uh, some, um, I would say that uh, if you think of uh, uh, business demand for services. Most companies, when when this first hit, so that could have been China in, in late January, Italy in March, pretty much everywhere in the world by April. Um, one of the first parts of any kind of uh, playbook mm -hmm. uh, on uh, when you have this uncertainty and you're not sure what's going to happen in your top line is is obviously you look at uh, you look at your cost, you look at your spending. Um, and so th there is some hit on that and that obviously sometimes correlate if you're, uh, depending on what uh, what industry your your client is. If we have a client who's an airline, they may not uh, be uh, <laughs> in great shape. If our client is a you know, cloud-based tech company enabling work from home, the other extreme, they might be positive. So I think what we found is that there was some immediate impact, um, but it's also come back quite fast because what is what is um, timeless and doesn't change even in this period. In fact, it, it's it might heighten it is the need for high quality strategic guidance. Back where you started the question, really, and now that uh, 
most companies have gone past that first shock. You know, we said, you got punched in the face. We used to say Mike Tyson here in Manila. You say, it's by Manny Pacquiao. Um, you would, uh, you now have to say, okay, I survived for most companies. So what should my plan be to get to the other side of COVID? And that actually creates intrinsic demand for services uh, companies like us provide. Yeah, so business has come back quite strong. Uh, uh, as you've dealt with your clients these past months, what has been your impression about how companies in general have so far been dealing with what's happening now? Because uh, I have the impression or I've heard of some observations that many are just digging in and waiting for some semblance of uh, normalization? It varies quite a bit by, uh, I think of it, uh, what might be obvious is it varies by country, depending on where you are, you know, how a Japanese uh, CEO might think about COVID today will be very different from how someone in India might be thinking about it. It obviously varies quite a bit by industry. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, you can think at the extremes. There are some industries where the impact on the company is an immediate downward hit. Airlines, hotels, tourism, um, discretionary spending, you know, luxury goods, etc. There's under, there's other industries actually the immediate impact is positive. Um, some technology businesses, um, many um, many food companies that. Uh, and then the, and so everyone is thinking about this a little bit based on what is the shape for my specific industry and then within my industry what's what's also interesting is your strategic options depending on your how strong you are within the industry if you know you're going to survive if you know you're actually going to be uh, around no matter what two years from now whenever you think covid is your ends, your your set of uh, options are are quite meaningful compared to companies that uh, are you know are thinking about survival. So we're we're seeing meaningful segmentation between uh, management teams that are already now playing offense. When they say play offense as a company, invest in the future, uh, lean into how we will gain share during and after the COVID period perhaps start acquiring some other companies now that who are weaker in your industry. Um, that's one set of companies and we see that. And another set might just be trying to survive. <laughs> and, uh, and then there's some in the middle that you might say that, you know, just let, let's hold on and, and somewhat figure out what happens until we see what the shape of this thing is. So, um, you know, one thing I will say, um, having observed, uh, I've lived through, um, even at Bain, where I've been for over 30 years, um, past, past periods of downturn and recession. Um, the global financial crisis in 08, 09, um, 2001, I was in New York in 9-11, and that, that period after the Asian crisis and SARS. The actions companies take during this period, 2020, maybe the first half of 2021, sets up a dramatic um, performance trajectory afterwards. And if you look at the companies that invested and won during this period of uncertainty, they were the ones that on average grew share and, and had high growth in the decade that followed. And, and that, that clearly played out in uh, 2010 to 2020 after the last downturn. So I, we expect that'll happen here too. Mm -hmm. You can't just play defense during this period. Right. Um, when... right. Well, Bain talks uh, about the need for to be agile enough to fight so-called micro battles. And you yourself have said that you can't just be content with survival, but at some point you've got to go to uh, on the offensive. Can you just give us a an idea of uh, how do you do something like that at a crisis like this? What phases do you go through for a, for a business? Uh, I'll comment on, uh, think of this as a life cycle of how it might have played out for a typical company, really the last 120 days. 
Um, and then I'll add the, uh, the micro battle uh, that you mentioned. Um, you know, the first stage was you basically secure yourself. That's what everyone had to do. That's the playbook. Um, make sure your cash position is strong. Make sure you keep your employees safe. Make sure your balance sheet is healthy. You know, collect <laughs> collect what you can and and get some sense of what is my uh, uh, what are the things I need to sort of first survive. You know, one one way to think about it: if you're if you're if you're a doctor, the first thing you do is you got to protect. <laughs> You got to put on your PPE and your masks and your protective gear because if you're not keeping yourself safe, you can't help your patients or companies can't help their customers. Um, once you have that, then it's really a thought process of how much of my time and energy should I spend on playing, planning for the recovery, you know, when it comes let's say the rest of 2020 and we've already seen this play out in some countries and um and what's hardest is um, and, and if you do that you might be able to deliver good outcomes and good financial performance you know for this year the um, the uh, the harder question is what investment should i be making um, so that i'll actually be strong after this let's say most people would expect this thing will not be over. Um, widely deployed, effective vaccines. Um, chances are this thing is not really over till 2022 and beyond when we get back to whatever the new normal is. Mm -hmm. So then part of what uh, every company uh, that is thinking offense is wrestling with, you know, do I, do I play offense to win this round you skip with a boxing analogy or am i playing to to win the overall fight and i have to put some energy away for rounds 10 11 12. and so the uh, the idea of a, a micro battle concept is to uh, to define units of strategic choice in smaller terms in micro terms so that you can uh, you can see the results faster and then you can make you can build the second micro battle and the second micro battle after that and so uh for for companies that are now in this that have moved to wanting to play some offense balancing the investments we make to to come out in the future versus you know, what most people might spend their energy doing let's 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 have better economics for the rest of this year when the, when the economy starts coming back. Those are often very different things. Yes. Your, your comment about micro battles uh, implies, I think, the need for for small teams in, in a business that are focused on planning uh, the next step. I think part of it is uh, absolutely that. It's, uh, you know, mentioned how will companies be more uh, resilient. And so I think one of the things we learned here, the uh, the old traditional strategic planning model um, usually had a multi-year time horizon, right? Mm -hmm. Three to five years, you build a strategic plan, you invest, and then eventually uh, you, you get there and, and you bring your organization along. Um, I think one of the things... Uh, things like COVID have educated us on. You have to be willing, you have to be able to move fast. You have to be able to adjust. You can't have a planning cycle that's measured in three-year budgets and a steady progression on spending that budget on whatever uh, strategic investments you needed to make in, in IT or, or people or, or, or um, 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 Salesforce effectiveness programs. You have to be able to just move faster. Um, we have this concept, uh, Willie, that's probably the bigger concept than micro battle. That's um, that's called being a scale insurgent, and I'll use insurgent to describe how companies were when they started. Um, every company was a startup once, and every company that's successful today navigated a growth stage where you went from a startup to a meaningful company you know when i joined bain we had 
five offices and um, only two in the U.S. We were only a couple of hundred million in revenues. Now we are 60 offices, actually, not 50. And that we have, you know, multiple billions in revenue. Um, but the concept of a scale insurgent is that most companies, when they become big, they become slow. They become, uh, they take a long time to make decisions. They become risk averse. They, they focus on protecting status quo because it's a model that worked, um, that got them to that point. And so, you know, the companies that we call uh, the scale insurgents, as you get bigger, can you retain all of the uh, characteristics and cultural style and norms um, from that growth stage when you were still an insurgent company that was trying to be better than everybody else in your industry because you had that. And um, companies like that generally act in micro battle terms, you know, mm -hmm. an Alibaba and Amazon. I like to think of Bain and Company, that part of my um, aspiration and ambition for my firm is that I want to be able to act today as a major global corporation with a lot of the characteristics that we were in, in the early 90s and the late 80s mm -hmm. when we were this fast growing small firm. And it's interesting how a period like COVID is helping companies find that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and often it's because of things like this. I, I've had many management teams of what some of the great CEOs around the world um, share with me. It's amazing how fast we can make decisions when we're six of us or eight or nine of us are in a Zoom versus when we were all in corporate headquarters in New York or London or Atlanta, if you're Coca-Cola and and every executive is on a different floor and every meeting is with people. Uh, executive across the world? Is that, is that across the world? Yeah, I'd say that, uh, you know, for, for global uh, companies um, that uh, have learned, we we don't need necessarily, and, and I'd say this could be true in Asian companies and it could be true in companies in Manila. Um, do we all need to be in the same room? in the same building, in the same conference rooms to make decisions, to make high quality decisions for a company. Just like we found as a strategic consultancy that we could really add value to our clients interacting this way. Mm -hmm. Many management teams are surprised. I've had so many sales to tell me, I am surprised in a pleasant way how effectively I can run the company on a remote video platform, at least for a period of time. Um, obviously, they also say, you know, over time, it would be nice if uh, we could get together and have dinner and build those bonds of uh, relationships and social capital. But if it's already established, um, people are finding this period, uh, one of the gifts is, wow, we can move fast again. Yeah. We can be an, we can be this insurgent firm like when we were younger, and that's that's one of the surprising, you know, silver linings here. But, uh, I think that's one of the main messages of Bain uh, throughout this time. Uh, let's now go to one specific concern of every business. Uh, undeniably, talent is one of the most important assets of any business. Uh, but at the same time, we've heard the challenges uh, posed by the different values of the younger generation. And then now comes this pandemic. So how does one keep employees engaged? And how do you preserve and even improve productivity at a time like this? Uh, I think it is uh, it is one of the uh, defining sources of uh, Strategic, dif strategic differentiation and even competitive advantage across companies in how you how you manage talent, how you attract the best, develop them, and keep them. And um, and 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 this is something we obviously know a lot about and can speak as as a firm whose whose product is our people. And so um, you mentioned the younger generation. 
um, I don't have a business if um, my partners and I um, don't have a successful firm, if we're not able to attract and, re and keep uh, the best. Um, so how has that changed? Um, one of the most important multi-year trends that we've seen play out everywhere in the world you know, to different degrees, let's call it, uh, there's different phrases for it or words, mission, purpose, um, stakeholder capital capitalism, corporate responsibility. Um, most people want to work for companies that um, have a clear mission and are making a difference, not just in pursuit of what maybe 30 years ago was the, uh, the ultimate metric, are you increasing the enterprise value of the company? Um, so I think that's, that's already been a multi-year trend. Um, and so in a, what's happened in a COVID world is that uh, two things I think are actually amplifying this trend. One is that companies as they, how they treat their employees um, during this period when we've had to all go to work from home and we're all trying to protect jobs in economic uncertainty is a moment of truth for building loyalty. Um, and then the second part is, as every, you talked about the young generation, and, and obviously, you know, here in, in this country, um, you, the, the issues around um, Black Lives Matter, racial and social equity, played out for all the world to see um, over the last month. Um, the ability, the need for companies to be part of solutions to COVID has become an important uh, priority. And, and, and I'm seeing this for most CEOs I talk to. They want to make a difference. They want to be part of uh, how do we cure this thing. They want to protect the workforce as much as they can, which means uh, perhaps having taking less profits, and they want to keep their employees healthy. Um, I think this is this is a multi-year trend. So, if you do both of things, both of those things, obviously you also have to keep running a good business because if you're not making enough profit and value creation, you can't actually fund the, the ongoing operations. But if you have a, a higher mission and purpose in the company, um, and you're also making a difference. And taking care of your employees. Um, this can also be a moment of truth. Uh, you know, we, we are one of the uh, Glassdoor call, call has called us the best place to work in the U, in the U.S. in particular. Um, the last few years, um, not just in our industry, in, in, of any company. And one of the metrics we have in our the health of our talent pool is um, our employees, our annual employee survey, that essentially says, you know, how highly do you recommend? working for this firm. Um, we do that once a year, we track it. Uh, this year we did it in the middle of COVID. First week of May, 98% of the firm was working from home in a period of uncertainty. We literally got our highest um, employee loyalty scores ever. And, um, and it was because of the things, you know, we, well, I'll speak as an example, but this can apply to any company. Are you taking care of your team? Are you are you keeping them safe physically? Are you keeping them healthy emotionally? It's very hard for some of our workforces to uh, to work from home. Um, and are you inspiring them by having some part of your energy as a company, not just about you know making making more money during this period of COVID, but uh, but making a difference with a different. Uh, to, to the battle, <laughs> we are in. Uh, for most of us, uh, you know, we, we grew up uh, we, we with with grandparents or parents who remembered you know, World War II, right? Uh, mm -hmm. This is this is for our generation, for our kids' generation. This is this is kind of an equivalent of a World War III, and the in the real global impact, and it's a war. And are we are we part of the solution in whatever way we can? I think those are the things that uh, 
actually now influence talent. Uh, we call it loyalty. You know, build, building talent loyalty is such a strategic imperative for every company. Well, can you give us an idea now on about uh, what the landscape for business could look like towards the end of this year and into next year? I mean, based on what you've seen so far, how could things play out? Um, it's very hard to predict. And uh, and so here's, uh, you know, so I'll, I'll just share some of the variables to, to think about. Um, uh, you know, uh, one is, can work actually continue in what had been uh, what had been all remote to now that will become some kind of mixed model um you know how will uh, how will the health patterns whether you call it first wave second wave continuation of the first wave and the the underlying trade-offs between restarting the economy versus you know protecting um overall health and, and there's multiple dimensions to health um, so what, uh, if, if you take, uh, you play that out and say, and given how different things like, um, regulatory and government policies are various countries are different. Each industry is the underlying infrastructure on healthcare and technology, tracing, tracking, um, you know, what, what we'll say is the shape of this curve is not going to be uniform. It'll vary meaningfully by by country and probably by in this by country type um it'll clearly vary a lot by uh, by industry um you know in in the u.s as an example you, you see the the u.s stock market is sort of <laughs> not even taken has, has come all the way back it's probably everyone asks is, is this a v probably not um is it a u maybe is it a, will it have waves that will come and go? Uh, we have so much, we have so much uncertainty. And so you're part of the question earlier in resilience, um, strategic planning that is not multi-year in nature, but, um, but encourages and enables you to act fast. Um, you're going to have to, uh, you're going to have to be prepared for different scenarios. Um, and then you're going to have to take some risks. So if I go back to one of the initial thoughts, um, the companies that will play offense are going to make some bets on, you know, will, will, uh, will this thing be over or not? Um, it won't be over in its completion anytime soon, but what is the shape? Um, you know, most of our uh, clients around the world think this will be some level of like this um, for a, you know for a meaningful period. Okay. Well, uh, finally, we've talked about how business businesses should change, but how will leaders themselves have to change? I mean, what kind of leader is needed now and in the coming months? Uh, well, I'm I'm a, I'm a little bit a student of. Uh, um, the, the CEO, uh, if you will, as sort of uh, a, a prototypical you know, corporate leader. Uh, I've spent most of my life guiding them, consulting to them. And I've spent the last year trying to be one. And you know, one lesson is it's easier to be a consultant than, uh, um, than the CEO. Uh, but, uh, but so far, uh, it's, I'm, I'm actually enjoying, uh, with all the challenges, putting it to work in our own company. Um, so what's different in, in the environment we're in, uh, you know, the, the strategy part of the CEO job is really critical at the moment because the, the nose for making the bet, um, taking the risk uh, and balancing that, the, the offense, defense, micro battles, hail insurgent, all the buzzwords we talked about, we talked about, um, the chief executive in the current environment has to be the chief strategy officer of the company. It's very hard to delegate because uh, of uh, the, the stakes are so high right now in whether your company will be a winner or a loser, whether your company will exist in two years from now or will be a dramatic winner like what happened. Um, 
I'd say a, a second piece uh, back to uh, a theme you mentioned earlier is uh, talent um, loyalty building um, is very important and what's a little bit new and different than you're seeing you know right now with uh, communications and media that's obviously you know your own business um, every chief executive I know is on some version of a higher level of internal communications the troops want to see you they want to hear from you whether it's a a, a um, all hands zoom or constant messages and, and emails so probably more than ever before you have to be a visible inspiring communicator uh, there were times depending on the industry where the ceo could be you know in the in the corporate office <laughs> protected by the cordon sanitaire and uh, and uh, would be like a head of state that would be hard to get access to. Uh, I'd say in, in the current environment, um, they have to be a leader. And then and then last, uh, you know, you, we've talked about company resilience, executive leadership resilience. You know, my, my friend, uh, this is uh, such challenging times when you're not you're you're often making trade offs that influence um, not just the profits of the company, the lives of your team, right? Um, and uh, um, making a, making a wrong decision can have pretty meaningful consequences that weigh on you ever more. And then the pace back to micro battles of decisions you have to be fast and you have to be comfortable with uh, you know with a batting average. That means you you'll get a few things wrong and. Um, and hopefully it's not life and death on those things that uh, so it's, it's a more resilient leader more inspiring communicating leader and a, and a very strategic leader and you can say you know were those useful traits in the old pre-covid world sure but they really come to um, come to the fore now well wow. Thank you, Manny, for all your insights today. Uh, it's my pleasure, and uh, I wish we could have done this in person and we could uh, catch up. So uh, I hope uh, I hope to get back to. Uh, I'm usually in Manila most years, a few uh, times a year. I don't know when I'll be back. Okay. But, uh, I wish you and uh, you know your uh, your audience uh, all the best. Uh, you know, my uh, I'm an optimist in all of this. Uh, our uh, our world is resilient. Our country is resilient. Um, We'll get we'll get through the other side of this, and uh, we'll just need to uh, to stay strong. So. And on that note, we end this segment of the Business World One-on-One -on -one Online Interviews. Join us again tomorrow at 11 a.m. for more insights from experts and industry leaders. Thanks for watching.
bellissima mattina! 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 <ride> Jenny, ano ba sa Italian yung ang ganda mo? Ah, sei bellissima. Sei bellissima, Jenny. Eh, ano naman sa Italian yung hindi ko alam ang gagawin ko pag wala ka? Ah, non so cosa fare senza di te. Ano sa sabing ang pabadala ko ng pera sa Pilipinas sa video ka ba yung savings account? Buongiorno, miss. Indiare de naro ora. Pilipinas. Posso vedere sa dokumento di identità, per favore? Quanti saldi vole mandare? A posto. Yes! I love you, Anna. Thank you. Ciao, bello. Ano raw? Wala. Okay na daw padala mo. Jenny, teka lang. Bakit? Non so cosa farei senza di te, Jenny. <laughs> 